Did you know they made a spin-off of the guy from Mario Party? Growing up with Mario Party on the Nintendo 64, it might surprise you to learn I didn't own a copy of Super Mario 64 until 2017. And there's a good reason for that. When you're five, video games are scary. Health bars, man? That's too immersive. This boo put the fear of God in me. Yeah, here's my history with Super Mario 64. My sister rented it, uh, we picked a file that already had some progress, entered Peach's castle, walked around the empty rooms, stepped downstairs, saw this unholy amalgamation of a polygon, and then we pissed ourselves and sped Crow to the Nintendo 64 to turn off the console like our lives depended on it. Dude! I thought this was a horror game when I was a kid, and that's what I believed it was for years, because I never touched the game again until I downloaded it on my Wii. Since then, I've given the game a fair shake, and it didn't take long for me to decide I didn't like it. Super Mario 64 is unbelievably cryptic, and when you suck at video games, it's not a good time. So many stars are like, how would anybody figure that out? And most of the time, your only clue is some garbled up message like wall kicks will work, metalhead Mario can move or quick race through downtown. There's a town? I'm overselling the difficulty, but I remember barely scraping past 50 stars before taking a break, because so many levels are either impossible to beat as a kid, or I couldn't figure out where to look. But 5 100% playthroughs later... It's not a bad game. I mean, the 3D platformer is my favorite genre. Maybe not the best time to reveal that, but I've always resonated with games where you just run around levels and collect doodads. Mario has a great kit for moving around the world, so he can- Yeah! Yeah! Woo! Yippee! And I especially love it when he- Oh my god, when you can long jump three times in a row, it's therapeutic. 3D platformers are fun because their levels are often designed to run the character you're controlling. The geography complements their tools, but also doesn't force players to solve every puzzle in a linear, unified way. The best levels let you interpret a solution to an obstacle without telegraphing what you're supposed to do. And that's one of Super Mario 64's greatest strengths. Like this star here, shoot into the wild blue. You can either launch yourself to this platform with a cannon like God intended, but it's also possible to reach it with a well positioned wall jump. A carefully placed jump and dive can thread it from above, and if you're fresh out of a mental institute, you can drop in with the owl. There's a lot of ways to get here, and many other stars share this property. In fact, I think Super Mario 64 gets better with each playthrough, since the heightened exposure to the game reveals all these alternate passages. And while I'd love to say this enlightenment came from my own experiences, all the glory goes to you two. Well, how else do you think I figured out I could jump into the paintings? I have a pretty extensive track record of not reading in video games. It's very likely I'd still have zero stars on Tiny Huge Island and would never have discovered Snowman's Land without the help of some random guy with a dazzle. And now I have nearly every essential part of a 100% playthrough seared into my neocortex. And I really mean it about the first playthrough being awful. It's equivalent to learning how to swim. The entire process is dreadful, but once you know, it's like, hey, this floating shit ain't that bad. Mario 64 is only fun once you've crossed the English Channel. My opinion after the 4th and 5th runs are way more positive than when I was dealing with the cramps and the water up my nose. Yeah, exploring the levels and slowly raising that star count is fun, but knowing what to do and then going boom 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 is even more satisfying. <laughs> Let's Super Mario 64 has 120 stars to collect, but only 70 are required, which opens up a ton of freedom in how you want to play. Levels each have 7 stars, and most of them can be found out of sequence, which means if you can't figure out one star, you can try to find another. Or you can just skip the entire world. Tired of falling in shifting sandlands quicksand? Quit going there then. And while it's a blessing to have so many options to clear the game, I don't want to play most of it. One of my biggest complaints about Super Mario 64, even today, is that most of the worlds are a bitch to explore. Like, every level past the first Bowser fight sucks ass. So many of them involve climbing up a mountain or treading the same path over and over and over again. It's either tedious or frustrating, and heaven forbid it be both. I said 3D platformers are often built around the character's moveset, but sometimes they aren't, and when something in this game messes you up multiple times, then you know it was slapped on with some sticky tack. Super Mario 64 is a flawed game. When you're the pioneer of your genre, quirks are inevitable. Bad camera, wonky physics. When it works, it works. But levels love to have an area or obstacle that defies the laws of fun. I threw out Tiny Huge Island earlier as a difficult level, and what kept it unexplorable for me was the section where you have to instantly learn how these gusts of wind above bottomless pits function. Succeed and proceed? 
or die. If you want to learn this mechanic, you have to risk a life. Rainbow Ride is pretty similar. A half its stars make you stand on magic carpets that slowly travel to their destination, and the further they go, the more obstacles you have to quickly vault over. And once again, a single mistake results in failure. TikTok Clock gives you some semblance of mercy by having platforms in its pit to save you half a trip back up. But the level's atrocious depth and small moving platforms will always break your spirits. Dude, Tall Tall Mountain is trap central in its design. Everything exists to make Mario fall off. Are you seeing a trend here? And even the levels without heavy consequences for a mistake weren't easy to learn. Wet Dry World has this whole mechanic where the height you jump into the painting affects how flooded the level starts as. And if you never hit the top, there's two stars that are completely inaccessible. Shifting Sandland has the quicksand I mentioned being a problem, but when you have the game memorized, it can mostly be avoided. But when you don't know about the shell and wing cap, get used to children's greatest fear. Bruh, Hazy Maze Cave is unplayable when you don't know you can steer Dory, which likely means you're not getting the metal cap and you're not getting any stars here. How the hell are the ghost house and lava world the tamest locations? That's ass backwards. So most of those complaints I made, very small in the grand scheme of the game. Many of them can be solved with a steaming spoonful of get good. And like I said, this game is way more enjoyable when you do. The most obvious examples being the 100 coin and red coin stars. In all 15 worlds, collecting 100 coins and the 8 red coins will reward you with 2 stars. And when you're new to the game, it is one of the worst feelings ever, realizing you gotta do this 15 times. And some of these levels, that's basically every coin. Every corner of the map, you gotta scour to find these things. All with the inescapable fear that you could screw one thing up and die and have to restart from zero. What definitely comes with its pros and cons, like yeah, I really don't want to be here right now, but on the bright side, now I know the level inside and out. And it's all the stupid things you never think to do that give you more coins, like spinning around wooden posts and ground pounding big goombas. Levels have these switches that unlock more valuable coins for a few seconds, and if you miss them on some worlds, it's an automatic failure. I hope you like primitive swimming controls because they put coins next to a current that will instantly kill you once you get too close. You thought you hated TikTok clock? How about now? The 100 coin stars are not a challenge for the faint of heart, but clearing them will reap rewards on subsequent playthroughs. You know, if you're part of the 1% who replays games annually. Have you picked up what I'm putting down so far? People who like Super Mario 64 are insane. And I'm one of them. It's me, Mario! Something I've always wondered about is Super Mario 64's cultural impact for people my age. People born after the game came out. As far as I know, my access to a Nintendo 64 was very uncommon. Nearly everybody I talk video games with started at the next generation. Super Mario 64 is probably like dial-up to them. Like we just missed it, yet... At least from what I've seen online, Mario 64 marks the present era for Mario. Super Nintendo chatter is few and far between. Mario may have been 15 years old, but this is his genesis. Dude got rid of his brother and said, knew me. I don't know, maybe it's a confirmation bias thing. But we also had the internet factor, which means a lot of people got their first exposure to the game through YouTube and speedruns. And a little thing about Super Mario 64, it's the most popular game to speedrun. Yeah, this was the fucking segment to talk about the backwards long jump. I don't actually care about being the fastest at a game or level. I mean, it's a nice facade to have, but I just like beating games fast as a reflection of my skill. I'm done frolicking around the castle. I want to play this game as little as possible. And it turns out a lot of people want to do that. And even crazier, more people would rather watch other people play video games for not a lot of time. Humans are truly regressing. Super Mario 64 is not just a fan favorite in the I don't want to play this game category. It has been discovered that you cannot play it at all. Yep, with the discovery of glitches, you don't have to collect a single star. And that's all possible with the backwards long jump. For those out of the know, when Mario performs a long jump, there's no cap on his acceleration while moving backwards. So when he performs the action against certain walls and slopes, Mario's ass begins to bend the fabric of reality. The man who has found the end of the endless stairs has found Nirvana. And while I'm not a glitch hunter for this game, I do have a story about the Game Shark. This has always been the most bootleg looking plastic I've ever seen. As a kid, I thought this thing looked sketchy. Imagine trying to get it through the TSA at an airport. So I've had the Game Shark for most of my childhood, and the only real use I got out of it was from renting Mario 64 again to break all its code. On this cartridge are cheats for just about every Nintendo 64 game in existence, and I've spent half my life thinking it was some kind of magic journal where I could write what I wanted and the game would just make that possible. All I wanted was the damn battle minigames in 
Mario Party 2. Why can't you do that for me? But yeah, I was just toying around with the Game Shark and Super Mario 64, and I opened up some kind of debug menu that brought me to the floating house from Rainbow Ride, and when I fell out of the level, it spawned me at the castle waterfall like I came out of the Invisible Cap secret room. And as I jumped out of the water, I started swimming in the air like the moat was never drained. It was a surreal moment live, and having discovered the house after the fact, I'm just befuddled how the warps and menu were all connected. I guess it's true what they say, that each copy of Super Mario 64 is personalized. Alright, so now that I've shot over the Nintendo 64's Golden Boy, let's raise it up again. What actually keeps me coming back to this game? Super Mario 64? despite its flaws, has a lot of those small things that add up into an unforgettable experience. Like, can we talk about how the hub world is Peach's castle? You know how cool that is? One of my favorite things to do in video games is run around the hub because it's usually a safe environment that allows you to comfortably learn the controls. But even better is when the location is a key zone within the game's world. I've always been teased with Peach's castle through Mario Kart, Paper Mario, and Mario Party 3 but Mario 64 is where it feels right to visit it. And here you get to explore every inch of this place. There's so many floors and rooms that it makes my imagination run. I think if I wasn't crying over Abu as a kid, I'd be roleplaying all across the castle if I was bored. And another highlight's gotta be the world entrances. Jumping into paintings, there's just so much potential with this, and the devs took it into directions I wouldn't have even thought of. Like wet dry world changing the height of its water depending on where you enter it from. If this idea was revisited, there's plenty more opportunities for puzzles. TikTok clock makes you enter through a grandfather clock's face, and a cool quirk about it is that the time you enter affects how fast moving components in the level will go. Tiny Huge Island tricks you with an optical illusion where the entrances to the two islands are identical, when in reality they're drastically different in scale. Jolly Roger Bay has a chihuahua going goblin mode on its painting, and I think it's really neat how two worlds are just chunks of drywall, but the game gives exactly enough guidance to not keep them hidden with a rabbit and mirrors. Yeah. If Mario 64 gets a sequel, I want to see more inventive uses for the level entrances. And another cool feature were the power-ups. The first time I saw Mario with a wing cap, I fell in love with it. Mario has always been able to use power-ups to gain an ability and cosmetic change, but having stars built specifically for them is where they become notable. The vanish cap blocks are always placed far from where there's a wall you need to pass, which means you gotta figure out where to go and how to get there before the timer runs out. The metal cap kind of falls into the same boat, but something had to be responsible for people hating Mario Kart 8's roster. The wing cap is where the real magic lies. Its controls are awful to learn, but being able to soar above Bob on Battlefield makes it all worth it. And speaking of the caps, no cap. Some levels have hazards that knock Mario's hat into the Shadow Realms, or maybe a wild animal steals it to sell in the black market. It weakens your defenses and is an overall annoying mechanic, but again, I see so much potential with this. What if you had to lose the hat to access certain areas, or if you give it to a character, you can control them. Just spitballing. The chain chomp though? I said the boo scared me. That was the easy one, and some of the earliest levels are the game's scariest imagery. Jolly Roger's eel has this dead, menacing stare and having to share the bay with it is really uneasy. The piano? Oh, I'd for sure never visit Big Boo's Haunt if I saw that when I was six. But at least they're not bosses. Most worlds you visit have one, and they usually speak a bit of dialogue, adding a layer of depth to these places. Sometimes they're tucked away, and finding their arena is an exciting feeling. I'll never forget the first time I found Wiggler's Hideout on a YouTube video. And who could forget the slow elevator ride down the pyramid, leading to a tomb guarded by Toltec Hand. The boss fights are easily some of the game's most memorable stars. And you know, I can't leave out Big Man Bowser, whose fights are iconic for how frustrating they are. And to beat them, all you have to do is calculate speed times velocity while also considering a margin of error caused by human response time. Oh, you're gonna spend 20 minutes figuring it out on your first go, when during the final fight, you have to do it three times in one life. But getting back-to-back -back successes, it's an indescribable pleasure. Some levels transform when stars are collected, Womp's Fortress rising and Bowser's submarine disappearing, King bob limbless corpse rolls back and forth in an eternal pendulum swing after we throw him off a mountain. Taken a step further, levels could tell stories with their missions, but it would have to come at the sacrifice of losing the freedom that this game has become famous for. Think about it, I commit villainy, 
and the next star is at a funeral. Warp zones, if there's anything I'd only know about because of YouTube, it's all the cool places you can stand to teleport around the maps. Common knowledge is the bridge on Cool Cool Mountain and the caves in Bob on Battlefield, but nearly every level has one of these dev shortcuts. And how can I leave out Yoshi? When you beat the game, the Yosh will be hiding on the castle roof. It's such a weird tease, like damn, we coulda rid that. Being the big Yoshi fan I was as a kid, if the planets aligned and I beat the game as an infant, I would have been like, MOM! MOM! Yoshi's on the roof! Mom, look! You're not fucking looking! Like, I just feel Super Mario 64 was so close to being one of my absolute favorite video games, but because of one ghost, it took an alternate course. But at the very least, I can say that I enjoy this game. Super Mario 64 wrote the rules for how to create a 3D platformer, a game with analog controls and a controllable camera. It had to reinvent how Mario would play in New Dimensions, and really how every game would play in New Dimensions. And while there's a lot of issues I found with Mario 64, its positives really shine through a critical lens. Thanks for watching the video, I hope you enjoyed it. Feel free to leave a like as it helps the channel grow, and subscribe to get updates on my uploads as soon as they happen. But until then, I will see you all next time.